Hello, everyone. I'm excited to have Jessica with me here today. She is just an amazing, precious warrior, um, just a special needs mama who has built in a beautiful community. And so I wanted her to come on today and kind of share a little bit about her journey and how she's built this nationwide community. Um, it's sweeping the nation. Let's say that. Isn't that so beautiful? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's so fun just to see other, other mamas loving on each other. And so I just wanted her to share a little bit about that. So Jessica, welcome. And thank you for being here today. Oh, Laura, thank you so much for having me. It's always such a privilege to be able to share my story and share about We Are Brave together. So thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Anytime. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your son and a little bit about your journey? Sure. And the diagnosis and then kind of what life has been like since then. I know he's a lot older now. Um, and you have other kids too. So can you just kind of tell us about all the fa family dynamics and all the things? Sure, absolutely. So um, thankfully I've been married to my husband, Chris, for 26 years. We have three kids, Luke, who's 22 and in college, Ryan, who's 20, who was diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome at five weeks of age, and Kate, who is 18, my youngest. And um, when Ryan was born, he couldn't cry and he couldn't suck. He could hardly move. Uh, I was discharged and he was transferred to the peds ward. So then I went and lived with him there for a month, not knowing what was wrong. Certainly we were asking for testing and my husband found Prader-Willi syndrome online. This was before smartphones. So I lived at the hospital and I didn't look up anything, which was also intentional. Even when I went home, I think two nights of that month, um, I didn't Google anything because I didn't want to fill my head with a bunch of uh, possible diagnoses. I knew that wouldn't help me in the moment. Um, but as soon as we did get a diagnosis, it clarified everything and it put us on a path and a trajectory and you know a treatment plan, if you will. So he was diagnosed at five weeks of age. Kids with the syndrome or babies are born with very low muscle tone and it's a spectrum. So it could be low to very, very low. Ryan was very, very low. Um, he needed a feeding tube. So he had that surgery before he left the hospital and came home. And we were working with an OT that specialized in feeding and that went on for years. Um, it took about a year for him to not need the feeding tube anymore and be able to fully take the bottle and also take... Um, food, baby food, whatever was appropriate at the stage. And um, when we got the diagnosis, when you read about it, it's crazy. It encompasses so many, so many things. It's a rare genetic disorder. It's medically complex. Um, although our journey for most of his life has not been uh, medically complex, um, meaning in and out of the hospital and a million surgeries, and he's not medically fragile. Um, in the early years, you're focused on all the milestones because with low muscle tone, all the milestones are delayed. So gross motor, fine motor, speech, um, feeding, obviously in the very beginning. And, um, and then what might, well, what does make the news in Prader-Willi syndrome is that in childhood, there's an insatiable food drive that kicks in because the brain and the body don't tell kids and adults with the syndrome that they've had any food. So they walk around either feeling hungry, wanting food, never feeling full ever, and um, always wondering when's the next meal, when is snack, when is this, when is that. And so um, getting an early diagnosis was extremely beneficial. He was able to get therapies right away, get on growth hormone right away, get into a PWS expert at UCLA who was there at the time. We don't um, have any PWS experts in California anymore, but, um, at the time there was one there, which is very comforting. And, um, and we were also able to get him onto a food schedule. Um, in the beginning, he was diagnosed with failure to thrive because he couldn't suck and he didn't cry for food. He didn't wake up to eat. He was a very sleepy baby. Um, so, you know, they put us on a, on a feeding schedule, but in PWS world, you have to have a food schedule because it creates food security is a phrase in our world. Um, so it's breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. And for us, a sip of milk before bedtime. So Ryan doesn't get like a, a bedtime snack in PWS. You have to watch calories. 
um, because there's lower metabolism. And so you have to be very careful. Some kids and adults are on a calorie restricted diet with Ryan. I'm very, very careful, but I'm not having to count calories. Although in the last couple of years he's had, he's gone from being very, very abnormally skinny, just I, I don't know why we weren't, I promise we weren't um, withholding. He just was very, very, um, He, I guess he just had high metabolism. And also he was on a full dose of growth hormone. And when that dose changed and he kind of grew into this adult body, he gained a bunch of weight, but he still looks okay. It's not worrisome. It was worrisome to me at the time when like after a year and a half, we saw a big jump in his weight because I was so used to him being, you know, so, 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 so skinny, but he's, he's doing okay. Um, so our life because of that food drive is, is greatly altered. Yeah. Do you feel like that food schedule kind of controls your day a little bit? I mean, yes and no. Um, he thankfully is not locked into the clock except for breakfast. I don't know how we got locked into 6 30 AM breakfast, but we did. So <laughs> it's there. Um, he's flexible, you know, lunch could be 1130, 1145, 12, 1230. Um, he's flexible at school. I think he eats his morning snack much later than he usually eats it at home. I'm just, I'm so used to it. I'm 20 years in, I'm so used to it that I've, I always plan for it. If I take him out into the community and it's during snack time or he has a doctor appointment, I always pack something or I pack his lunch. If we have to go up to LA to children's hospital for a specialist appointment and it's going to be around lunch, lunch is packed. It's in the car. He knows I remind him and he's okay. So I'm used to it. I think the hardest is um, we don't go to restaurants as a family. It's just too mm -hmm. stressful. His anxiety goes up one-on-one. -on -one, he's okay. But even so, he can still be very anxious, but one-on-one -on -one is better than the whole family because then everybody sort of rides the anxiety roller coaster. Um, and we don't do family trips because he becomes insecure about his food schedule when we're out of his normal routine. And again, one-on-one -on -one has proven to be pretty okay, but as a family, it's too, it's too much. And we spend the whole family vacation managing the food schedule and his behavior and his anxiety. And it's, it's not really pleasant for everybody else. Yeah. Have you guys gotten to a place where you do, I realize your kids are older now, but so mm -hmm. I guess asked, did you get to a place where you did family vacations and had him stay home with rest? Yes. Yes. We've done that for many years actually. And oh. we've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one trips through the years with the other kids, one-on-one -on -one trips with Ryan, just to try to to, to meet the needs of the siblings for sure, because it's very traumatic to grow up with a sibling with a disability or any intense need, whether it's mental health or medical, genetic, developmental, whatever, whatever it is, um, the other kiddos really, really need your attention. Yeah. How, how have you found, um, ways in which to support that? To like talk to them about it to mm -hmm. kind of not read their minds, but yeah, you I can't read their kids. minds. Yeah. You can't read their <laughs> minds. That's for sure. I mean, just like in marriage, we're not mind readers. Well, we can't read our kids' minds. And that's something that I would tell moms earlier in the journey is to tell the siblings, they have a voice in the family that their needs, their hurts, their dreams, their wants, their stresses matter. And just because your brother or your sister seem to take up all the energy and attention in the room, in the family, your voice matters. And so please speak up because I will not be able to read your mind, no matter how loving, involved, attuned mom or dad that I am, I will never be able to read your mind. And so I need you to speak up. So I wish I would have started telling my kids that when they were five years old. And I've learned a lot in the last few years, we did some family therapy. I wish we had done it when the kids were little before they could say, no, I'm not going to go. Uh, and we have done it as they have, you know, teens and young adults. Um, and it's been really, really, it was really hard to hear some things, but it was also very beneficial. Hmm. I love that. I love that giving them permission and giving them those words around it, because that's the piece. Where I'm like, I don't, do they even know any difference of what they're growing up in? Right. So um, right. I think that's beautiful. Giving them those words to, 
to get their minds thinking of like, oh yeah, I can say something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I find that a lot of adoptive moms, I know that these are two totally different things that we're talking about, but kids from hard places and kids with um, different disabilities. But so with ours, with FASD, I feel like so many things you're saying really resonate with me, just like going on trips and the whole trip mm-hmm. becoming about managing them and their behavior and all the things. And I love that you have probably given moms, which I mean, you just did, but just giving that permission of like, Hey, it's okay to have respite from that. And it's yeah. okay to go on a trip without, without your special needs buddies for a while so that you can relax and let down and be with your other people and really enjoy that. And it not be just work and just like, it felt so much more stressful going on trips um, mm-hmm. with special buddies. And so I love that. I love that y'all did that too. Thank you. Yeah. I'm giving you permission to one, take care of your own mental health and to take care of your marriage and to take care of the siblings. And, and it's so okay. And so normal to feel like you need a break and that you want to have a family vacation with your other kids. It's so, it's so okay. It's so okay. I love that. I feel like people need to just listen to that little snippet on repeat. Um, that's beautiful. Okay. I want you to tell us all about We Are Brave Together because I, I just am amazed at how you've built up this community and um, yeah, just tell us about it. I won't okay. my words. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. So We Are Brave Together is a nonprofit organization that I started um, with the help of great people in my life, including my husband. Uh, we launched in 2017. We had a logo. We had a business card and we had an Excel spreadsheet of about a hundred or 120 moms who are interested in being involved in a supportive community. Um, and then we just launched, we launched with, um, a summer party in my backyard. We shared our dream. We shared our vision. We told some stories and we gathered about 60 moms and we launched. And then we, um, we were able to get our nonprofit status in 2018 and start fundraising And we launched with the intent, and it's still our intent today, to combat the isolation and the loneliness, the burnout, the compassion fatigue that caregiving moms face. And so we are open to every mom, even if you're a sister caregiver, grandmother caregiver, we're very mom-centric. If you're um, you're a, a caregiver to a child any age with any diagnosis. So it's not just for moms who have kids with prader willi syndrome, which is Ryan's diagnosis. It's literally any diagnosis, including mental health, including learning disabilities, including ADHD, which, you know, most people don't think of as like special needs or disability, but um, really anything. If you've got a child with a genetic disorder, medical complexities, psychological complexities, anything, you are welcome to be a part of We Are Brave. And, you know, whether you feel like, well, my kids' struggles are kind of light and I don't know if I qualify Yes, you do. When your child struggles with anything to whatever degree, it changes your motherhood experience. And it also adds a lot of extra care and attention and appointments and therapies and tutors or what have you. Yes, you are welcome to be a part of We Are Brave. And, you know, we train our leaders and our core values is that our gatherings are to be loving, supportive, validating, and non-judgmental. You can say anything. You don't have to apologize for your tears. If you let down at a connection circle or a retreat, we understand you can be bitter. We get it. You can be grieving. We get it. So um, I just wanted to create a safe, sacred space where moms could just show up because I had had that in my life. I had created that in my life. I had wonderful people in my life whether it was just in my geographical area or in within Ryan's diagnosis. And I wanted that for other moms to have the lifeline of community because we have to have people in our lives who get it. And we have, you know, I have wonderful friends who do not have children with any unique needs or disabilities and they're wonderful to me, but I, I need my people who really know what it's like to be a caregiving mom. So we, um, we wanted to combat the isolation and burnout with support groups, 
low cost retreats. We offer retreat scholarships. And then along the way, we launched Brave Together podcast so that we could put out inspirational, practical, resourceful content and it could go everywhere for free. And it just makes me so happy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. And we've, we've grown. We've grown to 2,300 moms uh, worldwide. We represent all 50 states and 24 countries. And so we're growing and uh, we're growing in our um, connection circles that we have in different locations or states or countries. And if you're listening, you think, oh gosh, I want to start a connection circle. We we can do that. We can train you. We have curriculum. We have you know leaders to support you and and launch you. So let us know. We just don't want any mom to feel alone. Yeah, that's our and big. It can be such an isolating, mantra. isolating journey. It is. It is. Yeah, it is. I think the moment you say something and someone's like, "Oh yeah, my kid does that," and you're like, mm. Mm. "No, I don't think it's the same thing." <laughs> like when they try right. to you and it's true. Like, yeah. It's true. I know. I'll explain Prader Willie syndrome, and someone will say, "Well, I want to like hang out by the chip bowl at a party too," and I'm like well, this is actually life-threatening. He has to be watched 24 seven. We live with a locked kitchen. Is that the same? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's moments like that. when people try to like connect with you and you're like, you're so missing it because you don't understand it all. Yeah. And that's just so, it's so hard. I mean, it's it is. So hard. It is. And it, and it hurts it and it pushes the grief your... button. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said locked kitchen. I wanted to talk to you. I know that these are like two, again, all of our people out there don't have part of our Willie syndrome, but right. we have the food insecurity thing definitely going on. I feel like the impulse control, the, or the lack of impulse control mm-hmm, <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and just that need for controlling of food is, is a big thing in the adoption community. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, know that they're two different things, but I'm just right. curious, what are some tools that you have put in place to kind of help regulate those things? I, mm-hmm. I love the, hey, we're having this schedule, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks in between. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think having a food schedule, you know, reassures Ryan and we talk about it and we reassure him every day, you know, often, it's not as often as before, but he used to come in every morning. Who's going to feed me my breakfast? Very egocentric. Who is going to feed me my breakfast? And I would say, well, it's me or it's dad. And so that still happens on a regular basis, maybe not daily. So I think having a food schedule and talking about this good food schedule, and we don't, we don't have to post it visually, but I think, um, for, for families who are dealing with a lot of food insecurity in the adoption realm, I would post the schedule. I would post the schedule. Um, I mean, and I would give yourself a range so that you don't get locked into times because real life, you can't be locked into times, right? Even if you had only one kid, you can't be locked into times because that's just not life, but you could give a range, right? 1130 to 1230 is lunch, you know? Um, You could post what the menu is, you know, all the dinners for the week, because that's, you know, easier than like 21 meals posting. I'm not a meal planner. Um, And maybe that would also having a visual and knowing what's coming. And I think, so in our world, we live with it locked because obviously it's life-threatening. Kids and adults with this syndrome will eat themselves into a medical emergency when they're not watched 24 seven and they don't live with a locked kitchen and pantry. Um, And sometimes even a locked trash can. Ryan has been digging in the trash can lately. And so we have to have, we either have to lock that or come up with a strategy where we, you know, empty it every night and maybe lock the outdoor trash can. Anyways, now for Ryan, the locks settle him down because he, he doesn't have any hope that he can get food. The, the hope or the potential for food, like at a family gathering, shoots up his anxiety. So for him, the locks don't set him off. He's not going to break them, thankfully. Some kids do with the syndrome. So I don't know how in the world of a of adoption, if that would set a child off 
and make them feel like I'm never going to have access to food if they're already feeling food insecure. Um, I don't know that might backfire. Um, but if you do have a kid, anybody out there who's super, super impulsive and they're gaining weight and they're getting, you know, obese or morbidly obese, or they're at risk for diabetes, I would say lock because it's, it's a safety issue and you'll have to emphasize that. And of course, I would think in non-PWS settings that you're going to then get behaviors because if you've never lived with the locked kitchen, you're going to get behaviors and they're going to be very mad if they always, if they had free access. Um, I think it's very hard for moms not to give kids just in general motherhood free access um, because they think food equals love. It's kind of what we're taught. It can be very cultural and very different cultures or every culture. It seems like food is love and food is everything. So it's very hard for moms to say no and to not give in. Um, but we're only doing them a disservice. You know, if kids eat out of anxiety, then they're going to do that probably for the rest of their life, unless they get some intervention and some deep therapy. Um, I would definitely seek out a trauma specialist because it's trauma, I would guess, that these adopted kids have grown up with that's making them so insecure about food because maybe they grew up in such scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, so I would seek expert help for sure. I am no expert on on the world of adoption and what kids experience. So I just want to say that. Yes, you know, and I'm glad, yeah. glad you said that. Yes, I know, th I know that. And at the same time, I know that this is a common, a common struggle amongst adoptive mm -hmm. moms of trying to figure out the boundaries of what to do and what not to do. Um, mm -hmm. I know that for us, when we had to do a locked pantry to kind of keep out of the bars and cereal and all the things in there that weren't so great, we made sure that there were things like out on the counter that were healthy options that if they really were hungry, they could get a banana. Right. If they were hungry, they could eat an apple, you know? Yep. Yeah, um, that's good. Because it's not majority of the time it's not because they're really hungry you know mm -hmm. there's more going on there so right yeah it's I I love I don't love I hate that we share that yeah finality but things you're saying resonate with me it's like yeah that makes sense to me that just the anxiety piece around food and wanting to protect them from like for health reasons so I know right. that one and I appreciate your honesty with um just talking about your son eating out of the trash can I Mm. daughter has done that before and we actually had cps called on us because she did that in kindergarten and so automatically they're thinking like oh she's not being fed at home that's why she's digging out of the trash can right oh um, goodness i'm so sorry you had to experience that well people are real fun with us they have lots of opinions about our large family and yeah. um i'll leave it yeah. at that for right now yeah yeah but i appreciate your honesty because i know that I know that we're not the only ones. I know mm -hmm. that they're more out there and it's such a shameful, like if your kid's ever been caught eating out of the trash can, it's a shameful thing. And so I appreciate your honesty about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Our, um, I mean, yeah, yesterday, um, one of our respite babysitters who comes on Mondays for a couple of hours, she sent me a text, you know, even though I was in the house, she's like, well, when I was helping Ryan in his room, I noticed chicken bones in the he had like, he has this like plastic two drawer thing in his closet and um, she saw it in there. And so later I asked Ryan, when, when did you have a chance to get chicken? He said, I got it out of the trash can. And I said, when did you get it out of the trash can? And he said, he told me when it was, when I went to yoga, cause I'll go early in the morning and my husband's on duty, but it's so early that he's still sleeping and Ryan must, you know, he knows, even though he's cognitively and intellectually, you know, affected, he knows, oh, mom's God, dad's asleep. I'm going to dig in the trash can because that's my only source. Yeah. I mean, that happens to us all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily the trash can, but with like the hoarding of food and like hiding it and sneaking it and all of those things. Okay. Is there anything else that you would like to encourage mamas with just kind of on the special needs journey? Um, well, I would love to encourage you to practice self-compassion. I wish, again, this is something that I had known years ago. It's, it's a free practice. And I really think that, you know, we've heard so much about self-care, but I think before you can engage in true self-care, 
you have to engage in self-compassion because self-compassion helps you to recognize that you have needs and that your needs are valid and that even if your needs conflict with the needs of other people in your family, that you still have a right to have your needs met. And if you're the primary caregiver, or even if you're completely equally co-caregiving with a partner or a spouse, you need to take care of your own mental health. You have to preserve and protect your own mental health. And I'm giving you permission to do that without guilt. And I want to say something about guilt is that Guilt comes when we've placed unrealistic expectations on ourselves. So for example, if you've placed an expectation that you'll never leave your child, that is why you feel guilty. But if you've actually never said, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave my child's side, then there's no reason that you should feel guilty. Guilt is a signpost. It is supposed to point us and like, wait, what did I do? Let me evaluate. Let me think about this. But I think moms carry a lot of what I call false guilt because you're you're listening to either cultural expectations or you're listening to shoulds. You're listening to other voices that aren't necessarily your own voice that you think you have to live up to. So, you know, moms feel guilty about taking breaks or taking care of themselves. They think it's selfish, but if you're investing in your own mental health, then you're going to be able to care for your child for the long run. If you burn out and you end up in complete, utter depression and exhaustion, somebody is going to have to step in to help and you will have no choice. So why not try to head that off if possible? Or if you are in burnout, pause and say, it's so understandable how I got into burnout because I haven't taken care of myself and I also want to say the systems are working against us. Burnout is not completely on you as a mother. If you burn out, it's not your fault. We have systems working against us. We don't have enough respite help. We don't have enough respite or support care professionals, whatever you want to call them to help us. And if you have a child with extra needs, I honestly believe you should have help every single day. Like that should be given to everybody, especially if you work. And even if you don't work. We should have help every single day because we have so much extra on our plate, physically, mentally, emotionally. And that's not available, is it? I mean, there are a lot of moms who are not getting the services that their kids need. Their kids are spending a lot of time with them under their care when there should be professionals and therapists and OTs and PTs and, you know, behaviorists and nurses who should be a part of their everyday life. And so many moms don't have any of this. And so of course we hit burnout or we're at risk for burnout. So I would say, speak kindly to yourself, try to practice self-compassion over self-judgment. That's a starting place. I love the the guilty piece. I've never thought about it that way. Of, of course, some there's an expectation put on us, like, how beautiful to be able to recognize that and figure out where that's coming from. Right. Is it self-imposed? Is it your mom? Is it your mother-in-law? Is it your friend? Who's like, I would never take a break. My kids come first. You're so selfish or whatever implied or said or not said, but you're feeling it energetically from the people around you or whatever motherhood, martyr motherhood messages that you've received and taken in and believed. I think it, I'm giving you permission to question all of that. I'm so grateful for, I mean, like, I feel like you've given us so many little nuggets of permission today. And I hope people really take that to heart and really listen because I think they're so valuable and important. Um, Jessica, thank you. Will you tell everybody where they can find you? Oh, yes, where absolutely. So you. if you are a mom and you would like to join We Are Brave, you just go to our website, check us out, everything that we're offering, wearebravetogether.org. We're on Instagram at We Are Brave Together. We have a Facebook page and our podcast is on many platforms and it's called Brave Together with Jessica Pate. I would love for you to, to listen and have us be in your ears. Yeah, and it's hoping so you feel less alone. It's so encouraging. So for sure, listen in on that. <laughs> thank Jessica, you. Thank you. Thank you so much.